Hello, I'm Karen Hers, the learning resource teacher at Hills Corners Lutheran Elementary School in Hills Corners, Wisconsin. Thank you for joining me. Our topic today is movement, vision, and learning. So just how much of a difference can you make if you know something about vision, about movement, and their relationship to learning? We'll discuss vision first and then movement. And the last slide does contain my contact information. You may request uh, VISTAs or moving loft manuals. And these are guides that uh, will tell you how you could implement a vision and movement program in your school if you are interested in doing so. So how much of a difference? The statistics are startling. At least 25% of children have vision problems that can affect their development and progress in school. And nearly 80% of a, what a child perceives, comprehends, and remembers depends on the efficiency of the visual system. It's estimated that 80% of children with a learning disability have an undiagnosed vision problem. In one study, 70% of juvenile delinquents had a vision problem. And lastly, 25% of good readers have visual skill deficits. So what is the relationship between visual skills and reading? Research shows a solid relationship between visual skills and reading. And you, as educators, can make a difference in the lives of students by addressing the causes of learning difficulties. Treating causes such as vision difficulties rather than just the symptoms, like weak phonic skills, comprehension, and fluency, helps lay the foundation for success. Now, some students make some really great gains in their reading levels after vision training. Even as much as three years. Seems pretty unbelievable, but I've actually seen that happen. And reading fluently just happens once those eyes are working properly. There's no additional training that needs to be done. So let's personalize some of these statistics. In our Lutheran schools, Current statistics indicate that our schools serve about 235 students. 235,000 students make that. So if 25% have visual difficulties, that's about 59,000 children just in our Lutheran schools. So let's talk about your school or your class. And there you see a picture of Hales Corners Lutheran Elementary School. And I am in that building speaking to you um, at this time. But if you have a pencil or paper handy or a calculator, just jot down the number of students in your school or class. And then multiply it by 25% or divide by 4. And that would be the approximate number of students in your school or classroom that have vision difficulty can impact their learning. At Hills Corners Lutheran Elementary School, we screen our second graders. And we've actually found that 40% of our students suffer from some type of visual deficits that can impact learning. So our goals for today, um, I would like to equip you as educators with the tools that you would need to identify these learning-related vision problems and then explore some of the solutions, one of which is movement and a motor lab. Bridging the gap, that's what we want to do to help those struggling students reach their fullest potential and enable them to use their God-given talents and abilities. Firm foundations are necessary for strong bridges. They need strong girders and supports. Likewise, children also need firm foundations. They need a strong vestibular system. 
The vestibular system maintains our equilibrium and orientates us in space. It must function well in order for the visual system to work and for the auditory system to work. Students also need a functioning tactile system and reflexes that are inhibited. Now that may be a foreign term to you, but I will explain that later on in the presentation. But right now we will focus on vision. Struggling students, we've seen them in every classroom. You can recognize them as students with little confidence, low self-esteem, behavior issues, inattentiveness, they may be diagnosed with a learning disability, difficulty completing their grade level work, and parents are seeking advice from a variety of professionals. They might uh, request information from teachers, principals, psychologists, pediatricians, dietitians, optometrists, neuropsychologists, the parents are searching anywhere and everywhere to find an answer as to how to help their child. So what can be done? Well, there are lots of answers, but one possibility that is often overlooked is vision deficits. It's important for you to know that vision skills are learned and also that vision training helps struggling learners. Remember, if students have strong foundations, they can more easily handle that academic work. What? That's what you might be saying at this point. That was kind of my initial reaction. Are you telling me that vision can have such an impact on academics? I was kind of like that doubting Thomas that we read about in John 20, verse 25 unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. So you may be that doubting teacher at this point asking those questions. Does vision training really work? And how could anything so beneficial and life-changing be such a secret? How could simple eye exercises produce such amazing results. And then I began to see some little miracles, and I began to be a believer. So just as Thomas became a believer in the resurrection of our Lord when he reached out and touched Jesus, he could see for himself, you too will become a believing teacher when you hear a student tell you that he or she sees double and the words move. You might say to yourself, oh my, this really could be a problem. Or once you see increased reading abilities and greater fluency and attentiveness due to vision training, you're going to have one of those wow moments. And once you hear a child say he can now read his Bible, and that he enjoys books, you are going to say that is indeed a miracle. It's also important to understand that vision training can be a piece to the puzzle for struggling learners, or it can be the key factor that keeps a child from succeeding. My vision education, where did I learn all of this information? About 10 years ago, uh, when Hales Corners Lutheran Elementary School began a learning resource program, two parents approached me on separate occasions and asked me if I knew anything about vision training. At that point, I had never heard of it. Um, they wanted to make sure that I understood um, the major role that vision training played in their child's success in school. And along the way, many more parents came along and shared their stories with me. Um, this led me to Dr. Canel, Kelly Knippel of the Vision Therapy Center here in Brookfield, Wisconsin. And she helped me understand um, what vision deficits were and how they could so impact learning. 
I would also like to thank Janice Worm. She is a former learning resource and vision teacher at Elm Grove Lutheran School in Elm Grove, Wisconsin. Um, she taught me a lot. And she was also instrumental in getting a seminar held at Concordia and Mequon to teach some of the teachers in this area about vision deficits. I also read a lot of articles and books and visited numerous websites to learn a lot of information. And finally, through my students and their struggles and successes as we implemented some vision training in our school, kind of rounded out my education. So what I'd like to share with you is what I've learned over the last nine years so that you can help your students and now you don't have to do all the research. Vision skill deficits, what are they? Well, here is an obvious example of a student using one eye, head is tilted. And at the bottom of the screen, you see two websites. They are excellent as far as providing um, wonderful information for you as educators and for parents to help understand vision deficits and their impact on learning. Children'sVision.com, VisionAndLearning.org. One um, vision deficit is convergent or eye teaming. And this refers to the ability to coordinate the two eyes together so that they both point at precisely the same object. That allows the brain to combine the two images into a single clear image. Now, if we were in the same room together, at this point I would be handing to you two transparencies of the paragraph that you're looking at printed, um, printed on the screen, and they would be printed on your transparencies. So I'd like for you to pretend that you have one transparency in your left hand, and that is what your left eye sees, and that you have another transparency in your right hand, and that is what your right eye sees. Now I'd like for you to pretend <laughs> to match those transparencies up so that the print is directly on top of each other. If you match the print perfectly, you will have a single clear image. If you do not match the print perfectly, the image will be blurry and possibly double. And one more thing to imagine. Imagine that paragraph in a smaller font size how much more difficult it is to line up the print. And that's why we see a lot of vision concerns surface in the fourth grade. The print becomes smaller, and there is more reading in fourth grade, and it's much, much more frustrating for those fourth graders. Now, this slide gives you a picture of what I was trying to explain to you with the transparencies. In the top yellow portion, um, the rectangle, you can see the two eyes need to focus together at a single point. And when they do, the image is clear. But in the bottom yellow rectangle, they are not focused at the same spot. And so the print is blurry and doubled. If you were to go on the childrensvision.com website, um, this would be animated so that you could see a simulation of how a student with vision difficulties would actually see. Another vision skill deficit is tracking. This refers to the ability to control the fine eye movements, which are required to follow a line of print, jump from the end of one line to the beginning of the next line, and to follow a moving object. Students with tracking difficulties will often use their finger to track. And if you are a reading teacher and a student who uses their finger to track, please allow them to do so. Um, this will help them train their eyes to follow the print. At the very bottom of the screen, if you were to go on childrensvision.com, you, you could see um, the print 
um, jump along to kind of simulate how a student's eyes might see that has tracking issues. They um, jump from word to word. They can also skip lines. So students with tracking issues will often lose their place and their oral reading will contain a significant number of substitutions, insertions, repetitions, and omissions. And a third um, deficit as far as vision goes is accommodation or focusing. And this refers to the ability to focus clearly at a fixed distance, especially up close, and then also to shift focus quickly and accurately from a distance to near and vice versa. So be comparable to a camera lens if you're trying to focus, it's going to adjust. Some students' eyes take as much as three minutes to adjust once they look from near to far. So that's going to cause some blurriness. And this is, um, again, an example from jillchildrensvision.com shows um, if you were to be on the website, the print at the bottom would go blurry, clear, blurry, clear as they go in and out of focus. Um, students with this difficulty often have um, difficulty copying from the board. Okay, so now that you know a little bit about some problems that the eyes can have that interfere with learning, how are you going to discover them? you're going to use some screening procedures. And we do that with our second graders here and then on an as-needed basis. But first of all, we send a letter to our parents and we communicate the nature of developmental vision skills, the screening procedures we're going to use, and a permission form. We use um, a near point and far point eye charts for acuity. We also um, have them read a paragraph and we um, take notes um, as far as running records and, and um, monitor those errors. We do the de developmental eye movement test, and we also give them a questionnaire called the Convergence Insufficiency Symptoms Checklist. I'll explain briefly what each of those um, entail. The first one is for acuity. It's just an eye chart. HOTV eye chart. It's available from Burnell.com, and again, this is in the manual. Uh, oral reading and observation. So here's a paragraph that a student actually read, and the um, errors are marked on the paragraph. A student, um, when they read, we're looking for these kinds of errors. We would be looking for insertions and omissions of words, if they substitute words, if they repeat words or phrases, if they read slowly, if they yawn if they rub their eyes, move closer to the print, they squint or blink, they reread lines of print, they tilt their head, they lose their place. Um, and this does show an example with a student who had quite a few of those errors. And tilting head would be another um, example as well as losing their place. Okay. Um, Tracking skills, um, for, we would use the developmental eye movement test and watch for those smooth tracking and jump tracking skills. This is a picture of saccades, which just shows um, the jumps our eyes have to make in order to read. And then this is an explanation of the developmental eye movement test. The students in test A would read 40 numbers going vertically, in test B, 40 numbers going vertically, and their time would be recorded. In test C, they would read a total of 80 numbers, the same as the vertical, only horizontally, and the time would be recorded. If there is a huge discrepancy between how fast they can read vertically and horizontally, then eye movement issues are suspected. This is a norms test. The cost is about $88, and again, it's available from uh, Burnell. Then convergence issues. Um, Again, I'm going to have you um, just practice there uh, amongst yourselves or with your partner that you're listening to. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about pencil push-ups and convergence skills. Convergence, is, remember, it's the two eyes um, focusing together on a single point, so they need to team together and, and move to the center in order to focus on a single point. I'd like for you to pick up a pen or a pencil or use your index finger, extend your 
um, arm all the way out, and then slowly bring that pencil or your finger close to your nose. Your eyes should converge inward. And if you have someone else in the room, you could look to see if their eyes are moving inward. If you are using this to kind of check an eye student, a student's eyes, you would be holding the pencil and watching what their eyes do. It is possible that you may see an eye move out. But what we um, usually do to check for convergence insufficiencies is just this simple questionnaire of 16 questions. An example would be question number one, do your eyes ever feel tired? If the student says never, then we check the never box. But if they say yes, then you ask, well, is it not very often, sometimes fairly often or always? And then these responses are scored with corresponding points from zero to four. If the score is added up, and obviously it would be four points if, they, if the student said always. Any score 16 or greater is a pretty good indication that the student has convergence insufficiency. On the day of the screening, we use parent volunteers and set up stations, and that way we can get the screening done in a timely fashion. And then we have a form that we uh, fill out and send to the parents so they know the results. But the big question is, what now? What happened? Well, there are several things that you can do. You can do some classroom interventions, and you can do it with all of your kids because everyone can sharpen their skills. Um, there are some online screening and training programs you could use, or you could refer to a developmental optometrist in your area. As far as classroom interventions, there are some books available. And one uh, very good one is Eyes on Track. It's very user-friendly, uh, explains vision difficulties very well, and provides some activities. You can also um, make some mazes on your own. Um, you can purchase some maze books. You can begin with simple ones and progress to more difficult. The one you're looking at right now is quite difficult. You could put the mazes in your classroom or in the hallways for the children to use while they're waiting in line. And what they would do is use their finger to trace a path. They would cover one eye first, trace the path, then cover the other eye, trace the path, then use both eyes and trace the path with their fingers. They are not to move their head as they are to use their eyes. The eyes need to do the tracking, not the head. Visual pursuits, this is um, some materials you can make for your classroom. You could use a tongue depressor and some kind of image on the top or a pencil and a topper, a popsicle stick with a sticker. Um, the student would move the stick horizontally, vertically, diagonally, um, in a circle. They, again, they would cover one eye, cover the other eye, or use both eyes, and keeping the head still. This is really good to do with a partner, have the partner move the stick and the other person um, use their eyes to practice tracking. Another activity for the classroom is the sliding airplane bead. Just take these beads and put on a plastic cording um, hold both ends of the string and then alternately raise one end and as the airplane slides then the eyes can track. Again, the head should remain still. And uh, we also need to practice those jumping uh, skills. Um, if you have some handy um, people in your school, some volunteer parents, they can make a peg arc, and what the students do is they take golf tees and leapfrog them on that wooden arc. That arc is actually held up closer to their eyes. The plans for this are available at um, the Minnesota Learning Resource Center website, which I will um, talk to you about a little bit later. You can also do eye jumps, write some words on your board, your whiteboard, and just call out the words hope, faith hope, love, and the student's eyes would jump to those words. Finger puppets, you could call out elephant, chicken, bear, and the students would have their eyes jump. And for convergence skills, this is something you could do maybe before reading class, uh, transition time, everybody's got a pencil handy in the classroom. Um, have the students take that pencil as we talked about it, hold it in their hands, extend their arms, 
um, bring it to their nose, and their eyes should go in to converge on that. And um, if you're doing this in your classroom, sometimes the kids will see double. If they're bringing the pencil close to their eyes, it will split into two. Um, so there you have the double vision. And they should stop at that point, try to keep the pencil a single image, and then um, move the pencil back out and continue to go back and forth, kind of like a trombone, practicing to keep that a single image when it becomes double. You should be able to get uh, all the way from within about three inches of your nose, and then most everybody sees double at that point. So about 10 times of this is um, a good amount. And then for those focusing skills, um, pick up a, a treble light at uh, your local hardware store, put in a 75 or 100 watt light bulb, gather your students in a darkened area of the room, turn the light on for one second and off for five seconds, and then repeat that 25 times. I usually have the kids focusing on flashcards when the light is on. So you could do sight words or math flashcards. Okay. Then um, in a classroom, um, try just to focus on here the teacher or the kids and the clock that you see in the picture. But a teacher could ask a student to hold a pencil about 16 inches in front of their face, and they would cover one eye and then the other and then both. But the teacher could instruct, <clears throat> look at the pencil, look at the clock, look at your pencil, look at the globe, look at your pencil, look at the door. Getting some practice with near far. <clears throat> and repeat for 10 cycles back and forth uh, with the head still, no head movement. Hey, there are some online exercises available at icanlearn.com. This is a, a great website. Uh, here's a tracking exercise. Uh, students would follow the from the person to the hat, uh, matching. And this is an eye teaming exercise that would try to converge the two mice so that one are on, is on top of the other. Notice one mouse has a tail, the other one has whiskers, and when they converge, then you will have a mouse with whiskers and a tail. And then that brings us to some online um, screening and training tools that are available. We use um, the program by Gemstone Foundation, and that is an independent nonprofit research and service organization. It is dedicated to understanding how vision impacts learning. And I would like to share with you a about a two-minute video clip called Once Upon a Pond, and it explains a little bit about convergence issues and um, a little bit about the gemstone program. So I'm going to bring that video in here and we'll play.
Okay, so question there was, how is catching flies like reading a book? Um, you need two eyes that work together to be successful. So this is a picture of our computer lab and some of our students using um, the vision program. You're using the red and blue glasses and the slippers. These are some of the exercises. This is the focusing one, and the students need to find the dots and use the arrow keys to tell whether the dot is up, down, right, or left. And again, they're using red and blue glasses and um, some lenses. There are five three-minute training modules that they need to do with this program, and this is one of them. There are two tracking modules. This is kind of like a Pac-Man, and the image would change from red to blue, and the students would need to tell <clears throat> where the open part of the C is. And then the convergence modules, the students need to identify a diamond shape, which they're able to see when they converge their eyes and tell where it is located. Now, when the gemstone um, does their assessments, and they refer to convergence issues as eyes in conflict, they have found that 40% of the students in have convergence issues, and that 50% in elementary schools of poor socioeconomic areas, and in a juvenile detention facilities, as many as 60%. Then what are their results after they do the gemstone training? They are able to reduce the eyes in conflict or the convergence problems in 84% of the students, and reading scores have improved in 70% of the students. Okay, developmental optometrist, that was another option that you could do. They will have a COVD after their license. That is College of Vision Development, College of Optometrists of Vision Development. They are optometrists, doctors of optometry who specialize in vision therapy. They believe that vision is a learned process that can be developed and improved, and they use specialized equipment. They have a progressive program of um, prescribed vision exercises that help the eyes work together and with the brain to de interpret visual information. And they usually will have weekly visits to the office and daily home exercises. They do wonderful work, and they really offer the best vision training possible. Um, if you want to find a developmental optometrist near you, you can go on the covd.org website or their partner organization, Parents Active for Vision Education, and um, they will direct you to the right place. This is um, Dr. Kelly Knipple's website here in Brookfield, uh, Wisconsin. And she says, what the Green Bay Packers can teach us all vision problems, basically, that um, training hard pays off. Football training and vision training produce great results. Um, this is an excellent website, and she provides lots of information. So some of your local developmental optometrists may do the same. So a question that I get asked a lot is, if vision training is so great, why don't more people know about it? Um, optometrists and opto ophthalmologists are trained to prescribe glasses and perform surgery, and that's what they do. Um, these professionals will often tell their patients that there's not enough research to prove that vision therapy works. It's kind of like the days of um, the chiropractors when they weren't recognized for the work that they do. The medical fields tend to solve problems with medication, Ritalin for ADD, Tylenol for headaches, eye drops for itchy eyes. Um, we as educators, this might think the student has a learning disability, we adapt the curriculum. Um, and eyes that don't work well, we don't always see that. They're not as visible as arms that are broken or legs that are broken. And lastly, child may think that everyone sees the way he or she does and doesn't realize there is a vision issue. And then just a little piece of research, there is a paper entitled Research and Clinical Studies on Vision Learning and Optometric Vision Therapy, and that paper presents over 350 abstracts from 77 different journals um, from fields of education, optometry, ophthalmology, neurology, and psychology. It included all the works related to vision and learning, including the papers that purport there is no relationship between vision and learning, and of those, there were only 15. 
so there is a lot of research to show that um, addition and learning are um, tied together. Okay, now on to the movement part. Um, remember at the beginning of the session we talked about strong foundations and it has become clear to me after working with a number of students that vision training can sometimes be more successful if the underlying causes, causes of the vision difficulties are also addressed. So this could include um, uninhibited reflexes, which I promise I will explain to you, weak vestibular systems, and lack of movement. I think our technological society today and lack of movement um, causes our children not to be as ready for learning as maybe in years past. So this is a picture of our motor lab at Hills Corners Lutheran Elementary School. And um, here's another picture and a close-up of the bulletin board that's in the back. Currently, the cat in the hat is visiting our motor lab. About every six weeks, I'll change the theme for something different. So let me just explain to you a little bit about what happens in the motor lab and, um, and the reason for doing it. Let's um, think about Psalm 139.14. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Okay, God has created our bodies and minds to grow and mature in developmental stages. It's a pretty awesome plan. And movement is key to learning. So if the children don't get that movement, then um, their learning it becomes a little bit impaired. All right, there are a number of resources available to support this idea. And one of the books is Reflexes, Learning, and Behavior by Sally Goddard. And here's where I'd like to explain about these reflexes because um, it's kind of like a phenomenon that you, it's kind of one of those things that's hard to believe. But reflexes are involuntary movements in response to a stimulus. You all have at one time or another probably put your finger in the palm of a baby. And when that happens, the baby will automatically grasp your finger. That's called the Palmer reflex. That doesn't happen with an older child because the reflex has been inhibited. It doesn't operate anymore. So reflexes are automatic movement patterns that God has instilled in each of us when we're born. Um, they are needed in order for a child to progress through the necessary developmental stages. They help us crawl and walk. And eventually those reflexes become integrated or inhibited. They don't operate anymore. And when reflexes do not become fully integrated, learning problems can develop. So movement is essential for the integration of reflexes. And then a great book, Ready Bodies, Learning Minds by Athena Odin. Uh, very easy to read, lots of activities in there that um, provide movement activities that develop um, reflex, tactile, proprioceptive, vestibular, visual, and auditory system. If kids just came with instruction sheets by Stay Gold, um, this has a lot of movement activities. And also, you can check out FernRidgePress.com for some specific exercises to help children. Here is a reference to the Minnesota Learning Resource Center. They have classes available, and you can go on their website, see when they're offering them, and um, this is where I learned a lot about the movement program that we have at our school. They are very famous for their SMART program, which is called Stimulating Maturity Through Accelerated Readiness Training. They received a federal grant to share um, their program with other schools, and that's how they're offering these classes. But the SMART program is a multi-sensory program that includes movement activities like reflexes, rolling, spinning, creeping, crawling, the overhead ladder, balance beam. Um, it improves cooperation between the two main sections of the brain, the cortex and the brain stem. And when students are using their cortex for automatic functions that are usually found in the brain stem, that kind of leaves not very much room for thinking and processing information that they need to do with academics. Okay, so now, here's what some of these reflexes um, look like. There are about four reflexes that tend to hang on that do not become integrated and can cause some learning problems. <clears throat> they are the asymmetrical tonic neck reflex. And if it's not integrated, 
you can, um, the child might experience poor balance, difficulty using both sides of the body together, left and right confusion, difficulty crossing the midline, poor eye tracking. Oops, I'm going to go back to that one. Okay. Um, this is called the rocker, and the student would just rock back and forth with his head to the turn to the left ten times and then to the right ten times. A student that has trouble doing this will often bend his elbow, as you see on the bottom picture. That is a sure sign that that reflex is not integrated. Then the symmetrical tonic neck reflex, um, <clears throat> we call this the giraffe or the golden retriever. And if this is not integrated, you might see a child with poor posture, poor handwriting, weak hand-eye coordination, focusing difficulties. Um, and this enables creeping and crawling, which are absolutely essential to vision development. And again, the child would just rock back and forth, weight on arms, about 10 times. And then the tonic labyrinthine reflexes, if these are not integrated, then you can see poor posture, poor balance, weak motor skills, eye movement problems, processing concerns, and convergence issues. The exercise at the top is called the Superman, and the one at the bottom is called curl-ups or popcorn. You do both of those exercises three times for 20 seconds each. We do this in our motor lab. All the kids do it together. It takes about five minutes to do all those exercises. Other activities we do in our motor lab are <clears throat> rolling and spinning to help develop the vestibular system. Remember the vestibular system helps orientate us in space and it helps with balance. So we do about two minutes for the log roll or the pencil roll. Um, the other activity is spinning, and this is a spin board that I purchased from the Minnesota Learning Resource Center, but some parents could make these. They're just like a lazy Susan. Spin two minutes slow, two minutes fast. An alternate to this is to have the kids stand in the classroom and they put their arms out, spin like a helicopter for about 15 seconds with their eyes closed. Not too fast, not too slow. And then stop and open their eyes for 15 seconds. Repeat that for 10 times and add some music to make it fun. Okay, and then some additional motor lab activities. Creeping, crawling. Now on that yellow strip there, that is actually 10 pieces of yellow poster board that are taped together. Underneath that um, boy's hands are some flashcards. They could have um, a math fact, they could have a shape, they could have a letter and he would use those to creep down on um, that track from one end to the other. And the crawling is like uh, an army crawl. Both of these are cross-lateral activities that help the brain make connections between the left and the right side, which will really help with processing. So when we do the exercises in the motor lab, I bring the whole group in there and we'll do the reflex exercises and then we have the kids walk, walk through or move through the other activities um, as kind of like a, a course, and they just follow each other through. And they would do that for about 15 minutes. So here are some additional, the overhead ladder. Those um, directions to make the overhead ladder are available from the Minnesota Learning Resource Center. That was made by a volunteer dad. The cost was about $250. It is sturdy beyond sturdy. And then balance game. Okay, remember this informal reading inventory of the student who had so much difficulty reading and all the vision-related errors there? <clears throat> One of my students, after just working in the motor lab, improved his vision skills and this is how he was able to read. There were only a couple of errors as compared to all the ones you saw on the previous slide. <coughs> According to the developmental optometrist at the Minnesota Learning Resource Center, one third of the students she tested did not need visual training after they did work in the motor lab. 
So the motor lab can correct the vision issues. This is an absolutely astounding event I had happen here at Hales Corners Lutheran about seven years ago. And when this happened, I knew reflexes were real and it was something I had to include in my educational program. Um, there was a fourth grade student that I had and I actually had my fourth grade group that year. It was the year I was learning about reflexes and trying to decide if it worked or not. And at the beginning of every reading class, I would have them do the Superman exercise along with some of the other reflex exercises. And we started in October, we did it in November, we did it in December, we did it in January, and I'm beginning to wonder if this really works or not. Well, in February, this girl had a really hard time doing the Superman exercise. She could not get her arms straight out in front of her. After about three weeks, all of a sudden, she was able to do it. And at that very same time, we saw a huge improvement in her handwriting, from the large, scrawly handwriting you see at the top to the beautiful handwriting you see at the bottom. That happened overnight, after, complete, after that reflex was inhibited. So it took about 80 times, 81 minutes, sessions to do the Superman, and when that reflex became inhibited, that is the change we saw. In addition, the student became a fluent reader, and I know it wasn't just me because the fourth grade teacher went running to the principal saying, look, look at this handwriting, I can't believe it. So it was then that I knew reflexes are for real. And now I want to share with you um, the, the very end of my presentation here, a student that I worked with in the motor lab, which just is almost a miracle and is incentive to hopefully begin a motor lab program in your school or if you've started one to continue using it. But <clears throat> there was a first grader in our school who could not see the board and had trouble reading books. He begged his parents to read every other page instead of he having to read all of it himself. His arm and his hand shook when he had detailed work to do. And the doctor had prescribed an MRI to determine if there were any neurological problems causing the shaking. So we worked in the motor lab for two months from middle of March one year to middle of May. And here are the results um, that I put together at the end of May for this particular student. Pre-test scores, um, as far as vision, he had 2040 to 2070 were the acuity scores. He had convergence issues, score was 32, remember 16 was the cutoff. Um, on the eye movement test, he was in the 25th percentile with 23 errors. After the time in the most test, scores on acuity 2020 to 2030. Uh, no in uh, convergence issues, the score was only a five, and the eye movement test uh, got it up to the 84th percentile with only four errors. There were improvements in reading. As far as word recognition before, he was 80% at grade one, 60% at grade two. Comprehension was 70% at the first grade level. Reading level was mid to hard first, and he would ask his parents to read every other page. After grade three, 90%, grade four, 55%. Comprehension was 100% at the second grade level. His reading level improved to a hard second to beginning third. And he was caught reading his Bible in bed. And of course, that is small print. And there's more. The classroom teacher noticed that before, he had difficulty seeing the board. He turned his paper sideways to write. The handwriting was crooked. And completion of schoolwork was a chore for this student. But after the motor lab activities, the teacher felt the student could see the board and the word wall words. The slanted paper <clears throat> was no longer slanted in an abnormal position, but a normal one. Handwriting was straighter and completed schoolwork much more quickly. Then as far as physical improvements, 
before the motor lab training, they, there was the shaking of the hand and arm during um, doing homework and eating, those fine motor activities. When he was riding his bicycle, the handlebars would drift back and forth. And he walked with a stiff upper body. His arms were either down by his side or held in front of him. After little or no shaking, by the way, the parents never did go get that MRI, there was no drifting or movement of the handlebars while bike riding, and the student now walks with his arms moving freely by his side back and forth. And some really exciting physical improvements. <clears throat> Before, the student threw a baseball side arm and could not extend his arm to get the basketball easily into the hoop. After, he took second place in a pitch hit run contest, throwing two bullseyes overhand pitches and hitting a 75-foot line drive only four inches off the line. In addition, he was able to extend his arm in order to get that ball to the hoop and basketball was much more enjoyable. So um, I want to just share with you uh, an email that I received from that boy's mom wanted you to know that John received almost all A's, and the comments on the back of the report card stated that working above grade level and is very fluent in reading. His achievement test scores came back at 96th percentile. He has also been playing amazing basketball, throwing overhand, running while dribbling, and at home sprinting like a track star, pumping his arms. I'm so proud of his accomplishments, and thank God every day for you. My son includes you in his prayers at night many times. It's neat to see an eight-year-old thank God for sending you to him so he can be better. He's also a much better friend and not so frustrated. Wow, last year at this time was a completely different story. And so just in summary, results of a vision and motor lab, what can that do for you? You're going to see improved vision skills easier to follow the words, the print is a single image. You're going to see increased reading levels and comprehension skills, greater fluency, fewer oral reading errors, increased ability to complete schoolwork, improved handwriting. You will also see uh, improvement in ability to focus and attend to learning. Physical abilities improve, fewer reversals, improved behavior because they are, there is less frustration and a greater interest and love for reading. You're going to see some engaged learners. And so you too can make a difference by creating some firm foundations and helping students bridge that gap. Um, now my contact information is at the bottom and you can request the vision screening tool for assessing students which includes the interventions interventions or the moving aloft or both. If you email me, I will attach them to your email and send them back to you. So maybe soon you will have some success stories to share with others about vision and tra vision training and the motor labs that you hopefully will be able to implement. I thank you and I thank you most for serving the children in our Lutheran schools. 